Hello and welcome to the story behind the stories, your weekly look at the pages of the Nipawa Banner and Press. I'm Owen Devereaux, news and sports reporter with the Banner and Press, saying once again thank you very much for taking a little bit of your time to spend with us. This week I am joined by Casper Wehrhahn. Casper, good to have you in on the chair this week. Good to be here as always and uh, happy to have another good paper to go through for the viewers. You know what? We were just compliment, uh, complimenting this week's paper uh, just before we went live. And we thought last week's paper was pretty good, 16 pages. It was a smaller paper. But we were feeling pretty good about last week's. But compared to this week's, God, last week we, we just... We just got lazy last week, didn't last we? Last week we just... was a breezer. This one is much better. We have about like 10 local stories like from within the office here. Uh, so it's, it's good content this week. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. And, and not even in talking about when we talk about 10 local stories, we're not even talking about the front page per se, although we really enjoyed this week's front page. Uh, Kira Patterson was able to get a, a really nice picture out on the farm of a badger just popping its head out from the from the ground there. Uh, so we, we decided we definitely wanted to throw that one on there. If you want to get a better look at it, you got to pick up a hard copy of the Banner and Press, available anywhere throughout Nipawa. Just keep an eye out for the yellow boxes out and about on your travels. Or you can come down to the Nipawa Banner and Press office and pick one up. Or you can find it online at mywestman.ca. We usually put a digital copy out there so you can read it on your computer or on your phone. We're trying to make it as convenient for you as possible, so hopefully you'll take us up on that. Uh, to go along with the front page as well, we got an update, didn't we, Casper, from the province about maybe some potential more changes to sort of restrictions in Manitoba next week. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, that was coming down, uh, what was it, 11 o'clock they had the conference yep. on uh, Wednesday? And uh, yeah, they're talking about uh, vaccination numbers and uh, where those are at right now and what that might mean for how open things are in the province. We've really just knocked it out of the park. The August long weekend threshold, we've already hit. This is August, as we record this, this is Thursday, July 8th, and we've already hit the August long weekend numbers that they wanted us to. So we could be seeing that opening, which is about 50% is for most of it. Uh, we're at 25% capacity right now when it comes to businesses and mobility and whatnot. But 50%, that'd be great. Although we were talking about, we're not sure whether we'll find a, a way to hit that third one come September, because um, I think it's like 80%, 85% for first dose and 80% for second dose or something. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to peter off a little bit, aren't we, in terms of people getting their shots right now. So Yeah, that's how it seemed to be going, and that's unfortunate. But I am glad that, uh, at least for right now, people are really going in there and getting their shots. That's, that's always a good thing to see. And I hope that uh, people will keep doing that, and that this is just like a temporary thing that's kind of slowed down. Uh, because really the more people that are vaccinated the better like honestly if you can get vaccinated you don't have like an immune disorder that prevents you from doing that please do it'll be better for everyone that's right uh, this isn't in the paper but I'll throw it out there anyway uh, I just got uh, just over a week ago I got my second shot um, other representatives other members of the uh, office uh, have already gotten shots before before me, their second shot. Some of them are past their two weeks in terms of they can get their vaccination cards now or their vaccination IDs on their phone and, and kudos on that. Uh, so that's going to give us a little more leeway as well. But uh, we're all in this together. And hopefully if you haven't had your shot yet, uh, you do get your shot. And uh, don't, don't think of it as a cure. Too many people think of the vaccine as a a instant cure. You can go out and start smiling and coughing and hugging people. Let's calm down a little bit. All it does is it minimizes the impact. You still can get a version of COVID-19 even with the shots, but it minimizes the impact. Uh, so let's just all be smart about it. And maybe we can all just start to enjoy this summer and what's left of it. But, you know, We'll find out. We'll find out in the very near future, won't we? Uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk a little bit more 
and a little bit more in depth about some of the information they're going to be providing us in next week's paper. All right, we're going to go into the pages of the banner and press this week. Uh, it's on our teaser on the front page, and it is on page 8. Um, some vandalism occurred recently in Nipawa, but at the same time, there's symbolism and there was purpose behind it. Casper, you wrote that story. Walk us through it. Yeah, so some people uh, may have seen, uh, especially because it is up along Main Street, uh, as it appears to, to show up, uh, that it was on Saturday, uh, July 3rd, uh, you could start seeing orange handprints along the main street there, predominantly on things like, you know, street light posts, uh, signs and whatnot. There was the odd one or two probably on, on a building, but pr predominantly on the, the sign posts, you know, it, it was off the businesses uh, for the most part there. Uh, and those handprints come after the continuing discovery of uh, unmarked graves of Indigenous children at former residential school sites across Canada. Uh, I think there's only like two or three of those sites searched so far out of however many there are in Canada. I don't quite remember off the top of my head. Uh, so it, it's in relation to that, um, sort of just connecting that with the timing and obviously the color and the hand symbol is, is a very big thing. Uh, so that has popped up in the community. Yep. Um, and it it is going to get removed at some point you know it's standard cleanup thing but that's right we did are, reach out to the town on yeah, that yep yeah they're they don't have a timeline on when that's going to happen however due to the nature of uh of the display uh it is under consideration that there will be a permanent uh, monument put up somewhere in the community for that that's good to hear and and, and again there's extenuating circumstances around something like this. Some people may see it as black and white, and vandalism is vandalism. And I can understand your perspective on that. I'm not saying your perspective is wrong on that, because technically, it's not. At the same time, however, due to these extenuating cir circumstances and this development, this realization that we as a nation are going through right now with the discoveries at residential schools, and I hate and I've said this in the office, Casper, I hate using the term residential schools because in a way it really downplays what these facilities were, what was happening at these facilities. I, I wish we could find some sort of other, other way to sort of describe them, but, and hopefully someone smarter than I will come up with that sooner rather than later. But um, it is going to be looked after. And it's better... It, it's water soluble paint, you know, come off. Um, the, the memory of it and the fact that the town sees the significance of sort of potentially memorializing the significance behind it, I appreciate that. Um, and um, I hope you do as well. Uh, as for how this is gonna play out, we're gonna keep an eye on that. We're gonna keep uh, a view on that. Um, actually, I'm going to bump something up here, Casper. We were going to talk about this a little bit later on, but it segues pretty nicely into a couple columns that are in this week's paper. Ken Waddell, as always, had his uh, editorial, and uh, he talks about some of the, uh, the symbolism and some of the history uh, behind it. Um, well, first off, I'm, I'm kind of glad that it's a change of pace for Ken. Usually he's writing about C-19, <laughs> COVID-19. Uh, because it is something we've all talked about but he gives his perspective on this about the past and it's titled the past a good place to visit but a poor place to live and he, he takes a perspective on it talking about sort of uh symbols and and names he, he cites uh bishop grandin boulevard in winnipeg uh, a, a representative of the church who really had nothing to do with manitoba for the most part it was just um I don't know why it was named that. It just it was named that, and some of the um, some of the things like that. He he touches on the history behind it and how it's important to sort of you got to remember the history. You can't you can't wash away the history, but you've got to tell a version. Of, you've got to tell the truth, the true version of it. 
both positive and negative, which I do agree with. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, the whole, like, the whole John A. McDonald thing. We can't erase John A. McDonald from our history, but we need to tell the whole story about John A. His flaws, his wrongs, and, and what he did for our nation. That's the only thing that we can do, really, isn't it? Yeah, um, like I, I don't really know where I stand on, on statues, uh, kind of mixed things on that. I mean, probably as long as they actually tell the accurate history, I'd be more open to, to statues of the guy, I guess. I mean, I still wouldn't really want to see them, I'll be honest, but... Um, yeah, you got you have to tell the accurate history and like really John A. McDonald, he <laughs> you know, contributed to to uh uh really the the genocide of a people, so it's 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 heavy bad stuff and it it does need to be talked about and acknowledged and that's the same with res residential schools. Uh I know we were talking in the office before like that if I remember correctly, it wasn't part of your education, but I do remember learning about it uh, in mine. I don't remember how in depth it was. Uh, I think it. I think it was fairly decent. Um, but you know, there's there definitely wasn't quite as much as you might get doing your own research as well. Right. Um, but yeah, the this stuff, the discoveries, it certainly didn't come as a surprise to me because like I know what those places were I know what they were for it was it was to erase your identities and and assimilate them to according to to the colonizers version of what was acceptable and and civil mm -hmm. um, that, that so so the fact that we're finding bodies that we didn't know about not at all surprising, but it's definitely something that should have happened sooner. Yep. That segues quite nicely into another editorial. Uh, every month I get an opportunity to share my perspective within the pages of the Nipawa Banner and Press. And if you are a consistent reader of them, you know I take a little more of a satirical, a little more of a sarcastic turn. I try to uh, have some fun with it. This one, however, focuses on the residential school situation and how we as a nation are waking up from a case of, um, and I use the term, a historic historical amnesia. It was a it was a blind spot for a lot of us. Uh, individuals such as yourself, Casper, um, has a, a more of a knowledge of it because for you, a younger person, it is history. And I use this example, but for me, it wasn't. It was the moment. It was the present. And I cite a few examples. Don't, don't think I'm being flippant when I cite these examples of things that are older than residential schools. But it just paints that perspective. Pop cult, moments of pop culture, of significance, that were the biggest things at the time are older than the end of residential schools. Just, I, won't, I won't spoil it for you. Just give it a moment to read through. And I'm a relatively educated person. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I've, had, I've read a book or two from start to finish, and most of the pages didn't have pictures. So I, I, I've known some things over the years, and I didn't know. I knew of Casper, but I didn't know the full, broad perspective. What happened in Kamloops was an opening up for me of unintentional ignorance. And I think it was for most of Canada, I think quite honestly. I think that was the, Kamloops was the wake up call. What, uh, as a younger person who is a little more educated in the history, what was your take on that? I can certainly see it being a, a wake up call for, for a lot of people uh, if they didn't know about it for one reason or another. Um, and, to, and to put it into perspective as well, like people, uh, perhaps not so much anymore with all this going on as long as they're keeping up with the news. Uh, they consider it something that's like very far in the past and that, that happens with, with numbers really like 100 years ago that's, I don't know, <laughs> right? But when you, when you think about it as like perhaps like 
that's like one person that's still alive today they're like 100 years old like that's that perhaps puts it in a little bit more into perspective yep. but in terms of the residential schools i was born late into 1996 the last residential school that i know of there could be another one that was closed later uh, was closed in 1996, I think just a no, few months. Actually, 97. 97, 97, okay. 97, yep. Yeah, so yep. Th the last one that I had known of previously was 1996, so I was just like a few years younger than, or not a few years younger, a few months younger than the last one I had known of. Uh, now that I know that there is one that did close 1997, I, I could have sworn I saw it somewhere, but I didn't, yep. I didn't quite. I forget the location, but okay. yeah, I, yeah. Um, and again, I, I use 97 as an example in the uh, editorial mm -hmm. there, because um, I was already 25 at the time. Um, we joke a little bit about I'm the old guy wandering around the building, but at the same time, people younger than me, in not just a few months, years, decade, younger than me, suffered in residential schools, that puts it into perspective. Mm -hmm. That's not ancient history. So I hope that you do give a minute, give it your view. And if you have a perspective to share, please share it with us. We always appreciate it. We do have a few letters actually. They focus mainly on the toppling of the statues uh, in Winnipeg on Canada Day. But we did, do have them in there and we have other letters as well. We will be sharing as well over the next few weeks. Uh, on this or any other subject. We always appreciate it, even if we don't agree. Um, we always appreciate the perspective. Some people we agree with, some people we don't agree with, but that's what a paper is all about, is being able to share that perspective. And if you don't agree with a letter you see, if you don't agree with an editorial you read, give us a call, give us a letter, send us your perspective. Because, you know, as opposed to just sitting there, oh, I don't like that, and then doing nothing about it. Well, then I'm sorry, you're kind of part of the problem as well <laughs> in the grand scheme. Share your perspective. It's just as valid. Um, like I said, we might not agree with it, but we want to hear all the perspectives, and we mm -hmm. appreciate them each and every time. Yeah, and one quick thing I will add as well, uh, in terms of the, the residential school topic, is that like things like this, uh, have a very long lasting impact like it's it's going to take a lot of time to to recover like that's a generational impact that's going to take a long time to recover from that like there aside from the the schools themselves like colonization of Canada happened many many years ago but the effect on the indigenous people within this country is still ongoing. Really, I would consider colonization is still <laughs> happening. It, it, like, it's, it's not something that's just in the past and it's done. It's, it's still very much recent. And uh, I hope that people are, are considering that and finding ways to, to learn more and uh, help the healing process along. Education, knowledge is the key. I mean, we, we, this is an opportunity for everybody in this nation and hopefully we all take it. All right, right, let's. Um, we're gonna lighten things up a touch here. Uh, we're gonna talk about a uh, new fresh face that uh, hopefully will be greeting you down at the Yellowhead Center in the very near future. Once um, weddings and banquets and hockey tournaments and figure skating and gymnastics hopefully returns to that facility. There's going to be a new person there to be able to sort of uh, show you what has to be done and where's what. Uh, Lindsay, uh, and I apologize, Lindsay, if I mispronounce it, uh, De De uh has taken over as the new manager of operations for the Yellowhead Center, taking over for Chris Turner, who has moved on to a new career opportunity. Uh, got to commend Chris for the great effort and the great things he's done for that facility. Lindsay's going to step in and I had an opportunity to talk with her earlier this week about the uh, 
stepping into the new role. Obviously, it's a little quirky to be able to do, do it right now because it, the facility's not quite open to the public just yet, so it's a little different. It gives her a little more time to sort of settle in and get accustomed to the job, but she's very much looking forward to the challenge, and it's great to see um, somebody so enthused about, uh, about the opportunity in Nipawa. There's not much else to really say about that for the most part, unless there's anything else you want to throw in there, Casper. Uh, no, but this would certainly be a strange time trying to adjust to a new role. Um, not a whole lot going on in terms of uh, being able to hold stuff up there, but hopefully soon. And uh, it's good to hear that uh, she's adjusting to position well. You bet. You bet. You can find that story on page two of this week's paper. You can also find this story on page two. We're just going to briefly go over it. Uh, the second annual Dream Ride is on the go this month. Uh, for those of you who may not remember, the Dream Ride was a very special event that was put on last year by the, uh, and it benefited the Dream Factory, a Manitoba-based charity that was offering up children, youth with serious illnesses across the province, a chance to live their dream. It's, it was sort of a similar thing to the Make-A-Wish out of the United States. And it was great to see it sort of close to home like this. It was a, a young a Nipawa person who uh, was able to sort of benefit from that last year. Uh, it's a Brandon duo this year that are benefiting from it. But even though it isn't sort of quote unquote local, it's somebody out of Brandon, it's wonderful to hear, and Kira Patterson wrote the story, it's wonderful to hear and to see people in Nipawa are still jumping in and still, still helping out, aren't they? Yeah, um, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head here, but this year they actually have more participants than last year that are ready to go uh, to participate in this. And that's really awesome to see. And they are shooting to uh, hopefully break the, the last year's record, which was somewhere over $20,000 that was raised. That that's was, exciting. Uh, that was really impressive. You can find it on page two. It carries over onto page three of this week's paper. Really enthusiastic and really pleased to be able to share that story that Kira Passion did for us in, uh, in the paper. Let's shift over to the back page, page 16. Casper, you've got a story to share with us out of Carberry. Walk us through it. Yeah, so this is actually something that I didn't know was there because I haven't really been to Carberry. I've been there like once. And that was when they were filming uh, some scenes for that one movie there before. So I went down there and took some photos, but mm -hmm. didn't do a whole lot of sightseeing, uh, though there are some very nice historical buildings there. Um, but the Carberry Communities in Bloom uh, is receiving $3,317 uh, through a government program uh, for building sustainable communities. Uh, and that funding will help them build a shelter for uh, Pretty cool piece of history there, uh, which is a train luggage cart that is original from the CPR station that used to be in that town uh, and can now be found uh, at the CPR park there alongside the, the shelter uh, that was built there to commemorate that. So it, they, they chose this project because at the moment it doesn't really have anywhere to go when there's inclement weather. So it's been exposed to the elements and they want to make sure they can preserve that for as long as possible uh, in addition to, to the, um, uh, the luggage stuff that they have there for display on the cart. Uh, and uh, that'll, that'll take a good chunk out of their project cost. Uh, the total cost for the project is a bit over $6,000. Uh, so yeah, that'll be a good way to preserve some history. Nice, yeah. And it's great to see those type of things still going on right now with uh, all the problems we got with restrictions, COVID-19 and all that. There's so much work that's still going on, even though there aren't people that can sort of go to these communities and see it for themselves. They're all getting amped up. They're all getting primed for when we can return to that version of normal. And, and these types of historic sort of um, projects really just sort of, it's wonderful to see. Absolutely, I, and yeah. it, it really was sort of an interesting thing to, to read about there. I couldn't put the whole history in there, but uh, the, the line, as you can probably see when you look at the photo there, uh, the photo says on the, uh, the shelter there that it was DeWinton Carberry. So the line was originally at DeWinton, I think in 
1881. Mm -hmm. um, and then the CPR later in 1882 uh, was eyeing up Carberry for, for a new location. So it actually ended up moving there, the station. Uh, and uh, it really had Carberry taken off and it was there until I think the 70s at some point uh, when it was taken down. So it's really cool. All right, you can find that on page 16. All right, let's go over to a sport. We got a sports page this week. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of golf. If you like golf, you're going to love that page because we got multiple stories. Uh, we got a picture. Congratulations to Pat uh, Angers, uh, Angers uh, who got a hole in one recently over at the Nipawal Golf and Country Club. Uh, notched it in on, on uh, hole four during the Nipawa Senior Open. Congratulations to you, Pat. From the sounds of it, it was your first ever in all your time golfing. Uh, so, and you put in a good round as well. Uh, it segues into, we got some information as well on the Nipawa Senior Open. It occurred recently. Uh, Troy, uh, Sam Brook ended up winning the whole thing, taking the championship flight. We've got all the scores of all the flights there, some of the most notable scores. We weren't able to do sort of the full feature we usually do. Every year, usually the picture and the write-up and the stories and all that. But with COVID restrictions, the way they were, everything was a little more tight. Um, so we weren't able to do that, but we're still able to get the information for you. But fortunately, things are loosening up and we're going to have uh, some information and hopefully some pictures from the next big event that's happening at the Golf and Country Club. That's not happening this weekend, but next weekend, Nipawal Golf and Country Club will be hosting the Manitoba Provincial Amateur Golf Championship, a very prestigious event. The best amateurs from all across the province, 120 of them, are going to be converging right here in Nipawa to take part. And it is a, a sort of a formal, the, the same structure you're familiar with if you watch PGA golf. It's a four-day tournament. Every day they're going to play a round. Uh, after the first two days, half of them are going to be paired out. And it's just going to be 60 that continue for the Saturday and the Sunday. And it's, it's really something that um, Landon Cameron and the rest of the crew over at the golf club are really proud to be able to host. It's usually held in Winnipeg. So for Nipawa to get a, an event of this magnitude, that means something. That shows just how well regarded Nipawa's golf course really is. So we're going to try and get as much as we can on that leading into it. Hopefully a few pictures and obviously a few stories. Um, but that's pretty much it for this week's edition of the story behind the stories. Although that's not it for the paper. There's a whole lot of other stuff we didn't even have time to cover, really. Yeah, not <laughs> there is so much in this week. And uh, there, there as well was a very interesting uh, story in looking back uh, regarding the frequent store. So be sure to look at that as well. It was fascinating to read about. And it was actually a photo I was trying to find more information on for quite a while. So mm -hmm. I was glad to find that in our archives. But yeah, definitely take a look through the whole paper when you can pick it up when it comes out. That's right. Don't think we disregard the Looking Back or the Carberry page or Helen's Kitchen or any of the other editorials just because we don't talk to the, about them on a regular basis on this show. They are foundations of this paper, stalwarts that many people look forward to sort of reading each and every week. And we appreciate you taking the time to sort of pick up our paper and to watch the show. If you have any thoughts or suggestions for us, you can contact us at news at nipawabanner.com or uh, via phone at 476-3401. That's the number we can be reached at. If you have any thoughts, suggestions, critiques, um, as long as you stay nice, as, lo as long as you don't do any cursing over the phone or over, over the email, we're okay with that. Uh, so <laughs> we always appreciate a, a candid perspective on what we're doing, both right and wrong because we can't do this without you and we thank you for as i said picking up the paper each and every week and tuning in to nac tv each and every week for the story behind the stories have a good day